So Dan Satterberg has served in the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office for more than 30 years and was first elected to lead the office in November of 2007. Just for perspective, King County has more than 2.1 million residents, making it the 13th largest county in the United States. Mr. Satterberg manages an office with 240 attorneys and a total staff of more than 500. So Dan, last week our panel discussed the impact of COVID-19 on vulnerable populations. In your more than 30 years as a prosecutor, have you seen anything approaching the impact of COVID-19 has had on the criminal justice system? Well, first, thanks for having me here today. And the answer has to be unequivocally no. We went from going full speed ahead like we normally do to practically shutting down. Now, when I say practically, we have eliminated the Obviously, jury trials are put off until uh, July the 6th by order of the Supreme Court. We have reduced all of the out-of-custody appearances and put those off. Uh, but there still continues to be crimes committed and there continues to be cases filed. So in the month of March, which was really only three quarters uh, COVID impacted, uh, we still filed more than 430 felony cases. We had twice as many murders in March than we usually see. Our domestic violence cases are up by 30%. So serious crimes continue to be committed in the midst of all of this. And so it has really stretched our staff. I think on any day, we probably have about 20 to uh, maybe 25 people who have to go into to the courthouses, the one in Canton, the one downtown Seattle, uh, to get that work done. So we've, we have shrunk it. We're telecommuting if we can. Uh, but there's still some in-person stuff we have to do. So you mentioned uh, jury trials, but what other rights and laws of criminal defendants and the public are, are implicated by the pandemic? Well, certainly speedy trial rights are all suspended because of this emergency. And so if you are, happen to have the misfortune of being uh, in custody, awaiting a serious felony trial, you're going to have to stay there until uh, this this gets through until and then you know I think it's summoning jurors is going to be a challenge even uh, in July so uh, that's the biggest one I think and and we are we stopped filing non rush file cases but we have about six hundred of those now just waiting to be put into the queue so at some point we're going to start filing those cases assigning public defenders but putting off the arraignment date until uh, the middle of summer to. Uh, postpone the time when people have to show up. Now, one of the innovations and adaptations that I think is going to come out of this is a greater use of video. Just like you and I are having a conversation on this video platform, there's no reason that we couldn't do some of the administrative hearings that way. And I think it would serve the interests of, of defendants as well as the, the court and keeping traffic out of the courthouse itself. A lot of the, a lot of the hearings that we have are administrative of a nature you may have if you want to set a trial date you may have to waive a certain speedy trial right and that can be done on the record but it can be done on the record in video uh, lots of counties do it king county has been pretty slow to adopt uh, things like video arraignment other counties will have a studio set up in the jail on the courtroom and then they can arraign people that way and not have to you know, drag them back and forth uh, from the jail and put them in a small room together so there's some things that are going to come out of this uh, that I think will improve our practice, but that seems like a long way away right now. So what about the public? Are they being, as a, the rights of the public uh, to be protected, uh, to be informed? Uh, are those implicated by, by the changes? You know, this is a period of great anxiety and confusion, I think. And, and people read in the paper that uh, the King County jail population has, has been reduced from 1,900 to about 1,200. And that the Department of Corrections has identified a thousand inmates for release. And so there's every reason to think, well, that the, the institutions of government, the public safety institutions somehow have, are, are just letting people out continuing to operate. And that's, that's not correct. And, and what I hear more than anything from the public and from the business community particularly is that they're, they're concerned that there are people who are going to take advantage of the state home order. There's a lot of businesses that have been shuttered and there have been a lot of burglaries of those businesses. So the thought that the business owners staying home, complying with this order, yet their livelihood, the thing that they've worked for uh, is, is business is being broken into and, and victimized by people uh, without any sort of uh, uh, repercussion. That's a fear and it's not true, but we've had, we have had an increase in burglaries 
Uh, and we've been working with the Seattle Police closely to identify people who are prolific burglars. We, uh, two weeks ago, filed a case on a man who had uh, confessed to doing 142 burglaries in the last three weeks. So it, prolific offenders are out there, and so we're going to make space for them. So it's important for the message to be, yes, we do need to reduce the jail population. We need to create some distancing there. We've taken 600 or more uh, from the average daily population in King County, but we're still going to find a bed for somebody like this who continues to prey on the community. And I think that everybody needs to know that this isn't a lawless time. This isn't, we haven't just thrown open the city to the criminals. We are continuing to file cases, like I said, in the last month. Well, 430 felonies in a typical month, we might file 530. So it wasn't down by much. And these were all cases that we deemed priority cases. When we did that, we didn't select categories and say, you know, we'll always file these and we'll never file those. We said, we're going to look at the individual and make an individual assessment. So if you confess to 140 burglaries, even though a burglary might not be a, considered a violent crime, we're going to make that a priority case for us because that's really the only way to stop somebody who's on such a spree. Thank you. And you mentioned the governor's order uh, releasing nonviolent non -violent, uh, inmates. So what role did your office play in dealing with either the Department of Corrections or the King County Jail facilities in, in either putting together the policy or implementing it? So two different issues. First, jail. The jail is pretty important because people come, a lot more people circulate through the jail than through a prison because the average jail, jail stay is about 10 days. And so they come through and expose everybody to what they've got and they move on through and you know we have corrections officers and their families that we're very concerned about so in that case that was more of the, the local county prosecutor responsibility to help with the uh, jail reduction and we've been doing it rather than on a categorical basis we've been doing individual uh, assessments of people and, and identifying is this somebody you know there's only really two categories of people who are in pretrial detention in King County. And one would be a group of people who have been uh, charged with a serious violent crime. And if we release them, there's a concern that there's gonna be retaliatory violence in a, perhaps a domestic violence situation uh, or that uh, further violence will happen. The other group though is people who have failed to appear for every court appearance, maybe because they have a significant behavioral health issue, substance abuse, mental illness, whatever it might be and that there isn't any structure to release them to. So we want to make sure we weren't releasing people to homelessness uh, and, and to the kind of vulnerability that goes there too. So one of the great, I think, concepts that we're two weeks into right now uh, that I hope proves to be successful and I hope that we can hang on to after this is something we're calling co-lead, COVID lead. And you may know the lead program, the law enforcement assisted diversion program, something we've been working in partnership with uh, the Public Defender Association, Seattle Police, King County Sheriff, and ACLU. We've had this program now for uh, quite a while. It's been focused on people with substance use disorder. It's a, it's a diversion at the arrest point. What they did in response to this, however, and they had some money that they, that they needed to spend and had the idea of working with the hotel motel industry. And because there's tremendous capacity right now in motels, and rather than releasing people from jail to nothing, they're now under this co-lead program, being released to a motel room scattered throughout the county, but assigned to that person is a case manager with supportive services. Somebody's gonna check in on this person uh, and, and try to meet the needs that they have to stabilize them during this time. So we've never had a residential supported services pretrial detention program before. We've had jail or nothing, basically. We have a day reporting center, but it's not really set up for people who are uh, chronically affected by behavioral health issues. So the co-lead program, uh, they think they're going to have about 200 motel beds uh, by the end of the month that they can fill up with people who otherwise would be in the King County Jail. We had some people in the jail who we released because they had behavioral health issues and within two or three days they came back with a new crime. So we wanted to avoid that. And now we're going to release them to the supervision of a case manager. It's not probation, it's not that sort of thing, but it is somebody who can help support somebody who's going through a tough time. So I think the county, King County has done a good job. Uh, we still have probably more uh, people to re release, but we're not gonna release them to nothing. Now in the prison system, that's a little harder because the prisons were already at about 105% of their rated capacity. So spreading, there was no room to spread people out. In. So the, the governor and the Department of Corrections identified about 1,085 
people there and they uh, sent out a note to prosecutors and said, here, look at these folks. And they've been pretty receptive about uh, taking a second look at people we thought might be too dangerous to release people, particularly on domestic violence cases where the victim was fearful of uh, retaliatory violence from that person. But, uh, you know, we have to do this because we have to make space uh, to do social distancing uh, in the state prisons. And it's a lot harder uh, than it seems to be. It's a lot harder than it is to do in the jail, to do it in the prison. So tough case, tough uh, assignment for the governor and Department of Corrections, but uh, prosecutors by and large have been supportive and, and been trying to help uh, accomplish this. And, and I hope that we can get enough people out so that this doesn't take hold in our prisons because I've seen reports from around the country where it has and it's kind of like the same situation you see in nursing homes where people at very close quarters a lot of people um, you can't separate them and, and you can't really treat them and so we're working quickly and I hope quickly enough to make some space within the Department of Corrections. Is there anything else I should have asked you that I didn't? Well you know I'll, this is a tough time and it's a tough time for all of us and, and it's going to be some challenges that, that lie ahead of us. I mean, I mentioned jurors. Uh, we're going to have to assure people that when they get a jury summons to come into the courthouse that we are thinking about uh, space for them and that you know, a jury trial is absolutely essential. The whole system will come to a halt if that we can't provide those for people as we're supposed to. The other thing that's got me concerned as an administrator and leader of an office, my office has a about a $70 million annual budget. Uh, I've been told by the county budget director to expect that county revenues will drop by about 17% over the next two years. That's a huge number. And I've been through this before when we had the recession in 2008, 2009, in my office we lost over 50 FTEs, about 36 lawyers out of that batch. So we've, in the last 10 years, I've been sort of adding a few here, you know, I, I had more attorneys 10 years ago than I do today, and now we're facing this revenue drop. At the same time, people didn't get the memo to not commit more crimes. We continue to see a lot of gun violence, we continue to see domestic violence, burglaries, we are um, in, uh, using uh, uh, email to do a lot of the uh, domestic violence protection order work, uh, we're doing it online, and we're uh, taking guns out of the homes of uh, where people are applying for an extreme risk protection order. So our business continues to be at a very high pace and we're adapting to having to do it online from home when we can, although there's still an awful lot of uh, hearings where uh, attorneys are required to stand in a physically present in front of the judge. So there's a lot to learn during this period of time. And uh, I, I hope that we come out of it with some improvements that make us uh, better and uh, more able to adapt to what I think is going to be a different kind of normal when we get back to normal. Uh, we're doing a lot more telecommuting and that's fine for the people who can do it. The civil division in my office, most of the attorneys are telecommuting every day and, and, and are reporting that they're, they're highly productive in that way. So that's great. But the criminal justice system has an old way of doing business that still requires lots of people to gather in one big place. And so we have to figure out how to make that, how to change uh, with the expectations of that. And, and we're going to look to the public health authorities in our county to help us assure jurors and members of the public that uh, we're taking all the proper precautions uh, required by medical science so that their experience in the courthouse is as safe as that can be. But these are all uncharted waters, the unknown unknowns in the old Rumsfeld uh, trilogy are still out there. We don't know everything that we don't know about this disease uh, and, and we may have to change some things that we haven't anticipated yet, but uh, we're still very early in this and uh, but we've got some tremendous leadership in my office and at King County and uh, I think the creativity of people asking questions about why do we do things the way we do and maybe considering other ways to do it, that could be the best thing that comes out of it. Thank you. I, I, I neglected to mention then when I introduced you that you're an alumnus of UW Law School and one of our most illustrious alumnus, and you've always been such a great friend of the law school. So I appreciate that and your time here. Do this, and, and I, I need to say that my father was a UW grad, my wife was a UW Law School grad, and my son. So I think we've, we've donated a lot over the years and continue to be, to be big fans. And, and I think uh, this can be a, a kind of a depressing and anxious time for law students, but I 
we're going to come out of this and we're going to need people who are creative and dedicated to justice. I think there's going to be a place for everybody in your class to come make a difference in our community. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Mr. Satterberg. Take care.